You're listening to the Armchair GM Sports Network. The following podcast is under review. You're listening to the Under Review Hockey Podcast, your Niagara source for all trending NHL topics, previews, analysis, in-depth discussions, and live coverage of events like the NHL Draft, Trade Deadline, and Free Agency. Here are your hosts, Brandon Caputo and Kyle Kitt. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another installment of the Under Review Hockey Podcast right here on the Armchair GM Sports Network, your August 11th, 2020 edition, your source of North American sports coverage by sports fans, for sports fans, delivered to you right here from the good old Niagara region. Follow the podcast on Twitter at Armchair GM Pod. Like us on Facebook by searching the Armchair GM's network. Follow us on Instagram as well by searching the Armchair GM Sports Network. Listen to us live and on demand on our main platform, Spreaker.com, and the free Spreaker app. Please download that. All of our podcasts are on that app. Check it out as well. Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, IR Radio, CastBox, and Deezer. So wherever is most convenient for you to listen to us, we're on all those different platforms for you. Please give us a like and subscribe on any of those platforms to get all updates for new episodes. As well, check out our website, armchairgmsports.com. All of our articles, podcasts, sponsors, news on contributors, everything's on there for you guys. Please go and check that out. As always, I'm one of your hosts of the Under Review Podcast, Cappy. Follow me on Twitter, at Caputz13 with a Canadian Z. And I'm always pleased to be joined on the hockey portion of the podcast and network by my co-host and co-owner of the Armchair GMs, Kyle. Hello. You can follow him on Twitter, at JustKyle51. It's been some entertaining tweets the last uh, week or so following his yeah. beloved Toronto Maple Leafs. And uh, guys, we're going to just quickly touch on round one, the qualifying round for the NHL playoffs, and then we're going to talk about the round two matchups and uh, what that's going to look like in uh, what has been a very unprecedented start to the Stanley Cup playoffs. A lot of upsets, a lot of big name teams going out, and uh, Kyle looks like more than ever, maybe in this year with uh, the extended offseason that we got in the middle of the season, it looks like any team really has a shot this year, and it proved that in the first round. Yeah, that uh, that Sportsnet commercial with the Stanley Cup playoffs with the uh, the tagline unpredictable. Uh, yeah, it pretty much is unpredictable after this first round. Yeah, I mean, my picks in the East were uh, basically just ruined by a lot of things. But uh, I will say before, uh, like, I mean, we're going to talk about it, but... Some of the biggest upsets, obviously, Montreal and, and Chicago as uh, two of the biggest teams um, or two of the lowest ranked teams moving on. Teams mm-hmm. that were not going to make the playoffs uh, whatsoever end up becoming uh, and end up going to the second round of the playoffs. Kyle, what are your thoughts on that? I I thought for sure, like I know like tanking is a is, is a term thrown around hockey a lot, but I thought for sure Montreal would do some sort of. Uh, hidden tanking to try to get a, a, a Alexis Lafreniere, the next French superstar. Like, I didn't think for for sure that Montreal would even walk out of that, let alone the way they did. That was just incredible. And I still think my upset of the, the entire qualifying round is the Coyotes. Like, they beat the Nashville Predators three games to one. Like, how? How is that even possible? I'm looking at it right now. The teams ranked 22, 23, and 24 moved on. So the last three teams to get into this play in and round robin, whatever they want to call it, 24 team return to play format got into yeah. the playoffs. Montreal, Chicago and Arizona are now in the second round. So I guess I don't know if that's what the NHL wanted, but that's what they got. God, that's just it's it's definitely going to be an interesting playoff. I mean, it's it's something what we're not used to, like usually with a regular playoff, we're used to, you know, the weaker teams nine times out of ten not moving on to the second round and and and, and being eliminated in that first round and you know weaker teams not actually making the playoffs because they extended it by i think what was it they extended it by uh six or eight teams this year and it's usually 16 so 
and they went to I think twenty four. So it's eight more teams. Eight more teams. Yep. So yeah, so eight teams that weren't even going to make the playoffs to begin with were had a chance to qualify. I guess they're so oh, it's so confusing. With like, I still considered the qualifying. I call it the first round. I do too because it is a first round of a playoff. There's four it rounds. It is a playoff. <laughs> yeah, I mean there there was there's four rounds in the in the Stanley Cup playoffs, and that was the first round. Yeah, the only thing that didn't I don't consider a playoff was were the round robin games because those were basically just glorified exhibition games. Because after watching that, I no one was trying in that. I think we were right with that. I knew we kind of called it on on our lot on our last show before the it even started that teams were probably going to go in there not trying. I saw a lot of non trying in that thing, and a lot of teams too. They played their backup goalies like this was just to get your feet wet and to get a little bit of competitive hockey before the actual playoff. So. I don't consider that the playoffs, but I still consider the qualifying round as round number one. Yeah, I just didn't think that uh, like it wasn't good television, but I understand why they needed to do it. You could you couldn't just have those teams not playing, so I was okay yeah. with them having the exhibition. I don't even think that they really needed to show them on TV to be honest. Like they were not exciting whatsoever. No, I mean, I mean <laughs> we look we'll get into that, but the teams who ended up getting the first seed like. You wouldn't expect them to get the first seed because of what happened. But uh, with that being said, guys, we're going to take our first commercial break on the show today, and then we're going to come back and we're going to discuss uh, a little bit with the uh, first round of the playoffs and a little bit of the draft lottery as well. So right back here on the Under Review podcast on the Armchair GM Sports Network. Carmine's Pizzeria Italiano, serving traditional style Italian pizzas made with the freshest top quality ingredients. Loaded subs and their famous chicken wings. Winners of the Reader's Choice Diamond Award. Four years running from Niagara this week for best pizza and wings in Niagara Falls. Home of the best tray and wing combo in town for the price and quality. Open daily from 3 p.m. to 9 p.m. Located on the corner of Drummond Road and Dunn Street. Available for call ahead pickup or delivery at 905 374 Four four zero zero. Make sure to like them on Facebook and view their website for their menu at carmine'spizzeria.ca. Carmine's Pizzeria Italiano, way too good. As we all adjust to this new world that we're living in today, masks are now mandatory. And Niagara's own Custom PPE is Canada's leading face mask provider. Visit them online at customppe.ca and choose between several mask options with different colors and sizes. Add your organization, company, or team logo to make your face masks unique. Available to purchase online 24-7 at customppe.ca and shipped within one week. They have the best prices and quickest turnaround in Canada, and no order is too big or too small. Also offering custom floor stickers as well as face and counter shields for your business or workplace. Visit customppe.ca and use the code armchair at checkout for 20% off your custom or blank face mask today. Custom PPE, Canada's leading face mask provider. Attention job seekers, if you are currently looking for work in the Niagara region, you owe it to yourself to check out the services provided by the Niagara Employment Help Center, located at 6100 Thorstone Road, Niagara Falls, directly across from the Camisos Plaza. Their free services include resume and cover letter writing, community resource and referral information, local labor market information, job search strategies, assistance with clarifying employment training and career goals, employment counseling and job search support, second career information and registration assistance, and all their services are currently provided by appointment only. So give them a call at 905-358-0021 or visit their website at ehc.on.ca, the Niagara Employment Help Center. This employment You're Ontario listening Open. to the Armchair GM Sports Network, the Niagara region's best local source for North American sports podcasting coverage. By sports fans, for sports fans. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the second segment of our Under Review podcast right here on the Armchair GM Sports Network. Cappy and Kyle back with you here. Kyle, let's quickly talk about uh, the most recent news from last night. We had the NHL's second part of their draft lottery. So, obviously, (laughs) you've heard my thoughts on the whole draft lottery fiasco this year (laughs) with how I don't believe that all these other teams should have been able to have their cake and eat it too with being able to make the playoffs, have a chance at the Cup, while also having a chance at the draft lottery. The whole thing, I think, was just messed up by the NHL. But you know what? After what the result that we got last night, I'm happy with it. It wasn't Pittsburgh. It wasn't Edmonton. It wasn't Toronto. It wasn't Nashville or even Winnipeg. 
I'm happy that it went to the New York Rangers, Kyle. I know your dad is a big New York Rangers fan, so uh, what were your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think we can all sleep a little easier now knowing that uh, Alexis Lafreniere is not going to a playoff-ready team. Um, the Rangers were already going to be in lottery contention to begin with, so this definitely uh, was good for them to to win. And definitely it, it's eased, I think, a little bit. Of, I've still seen people like saying, like, oh, the Rangers shouldn't have won, yada, yada, yada. It's like, well, really... They were in the lottery to begin with. They just would have been the team that went from 15 to 1, which, I mean, I, I understand the lottery rules and I understand the lottery percentages because it prevents teams from tanking. And I'm not on board with going to the old format of, you know, last place getting the number one overall pick because that's just it's, it's just stupid. Um, anyways, um, I was happy to see the Rangers do it, especially for my dad, who is a lifelong Rangers fan. Um he was he was very very happy about it uh, happiest i've seen him uh since pre-covid era um but uh, yeah he was very ecstatic uh they, they, they said an interesting stat on uh on tv the last time the rangers had a first overall pick was in 1965 my dad was around eight years old at the time yeah so i mean that goes to show you that the rangers have not been in this uh in this situation many times in their history as a very good original six uh, franchise. So very happy for them to have this opportunity. They were 18th in the stand, the final standings of the NHL season anyway. So again, they were most likely going to be a lottery team. So I'm okay with that, but wow, two years in a row, the Rangers moving up uh, huge in the lottery mm -hmm. from getting, from going to second last year, getting Capo Caco. And then this year moving up to first to get Lafreniere, just uh they didn't even really have to tank, and they were able to accelerate their rebuild. So, must be nice, is all I'm yeah. going to say as a bitter Sabres <laughs> fan. And uh, it was a Carolina's Twitter account. They're, they're a bunch of buttes, those guys. They, they tweeted at the Rangers. They're like, you're welcome at New York Rangers. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, well, Carolina was one of the two teams with Tampa that made a whole stink about this whole playoff format, how they didn't want to do it because they didn't want to play the Rangers, and they ended up winning anyway. So, Carolina, the bunch of jerks over there. Man, Carolina, they they still walked out of this lottery in great position because there was a, uh, a clause on the Leafs' first-round pick. If it wasn't a lottery pick, then it, the, the pick went to Carolina. So, and that was the whole Marlowe fiasco last year as well. So now the Leafs don't even get, they had a chance at a lottery, but they don't even get a first round pick because now it has to go to Carolina, which ends up being a top 15 pick. I think it was 13th or something like that. So good for Carolina. They're moving on and they're, they got the 13th overall pick. Yeah. And bad luck for Toronto continues out even after this playoff round that happens and everything with it, with the whole regular, it's just been a, a really crappy year for the Leafs because if you guys seen the video circulating around, I tweeted it. Um, Toronto's ball actually almost got sucked up, but like John Tavares' shot in the last game, it hit the edge of the plastic that gets sucked up and back out, and then the Rangers' ball went up. <laughs> oh, just start. We just having a really bad like this. This season in general has been a really horrible season for the Leafs. Yeah, and uh, you can go listen to Kyle's reactions on the entire Leafs playoffs. He's got his articles up on ArmchairGMSports.com as well as his uh, Niagara Hockey Lowdown Leafs edition episode that was just. Uh, just released yesterday, so you can go listen to his full in-depth thoughts on the Toronto Maple Leafs season and uh, the playoff round against the Columbus Blue Jackets, which I'm sure you never want to hear their goal song ever, ever again. Yeah, I was a lot calmer than I when I should have been yesterday. I, I had a rough sleep, but I still, like, it's... I can't be pissed anymore, because we've done... <laughs> I felt this way for like the last five to six years. Like there's nothing to get that mad about anymore because we're just so used to it. And it's just like we're tired of it. We're sick and tired of going through this every single year. So, again, I, I talked about it in that episode that some big changes need to happen for this team, like 100 percent. So uh, good job for the New York Rangers winning the lottery. Happy mm -hmm. about that. Good for them. So we'll say oh, yeah. Lafreniere is going to be sweet with them. So we'll segue that into talking about the first round matchups and we might as well just start off talking about the Leafs and Blue Jackets. You've already touched on it a little yeah. bit here. Um, just what a series that it was the only series to go to five games. So that was already exciting. And then for us being in the Niagara region and in the heart of Leafs nation, even I was tuning into these games as a Leaf hater. I still want, it was still an intriguing series to me because I thought it was, it had the potential to go five games uh, just by the way Columbus plays. 
And uh, wow, Kyle, what a series this was. I'm just going to let you talk about it because you've obviously watched all five in g- games indefinitely, and I'll just yeah. kind of give my input here and there. But uh, what were your thoughts on the whole series from start to end with uh, the Blue Jackets and Maple Leafs? Well, I'm not trying to toot the horn of the Toronto Maple Leafs too much because they don't deserve it right now. But this was probably the most exciting series out of any of the series in the in the qualifying round. Like, I don't think any other series was as exciting just because of what happened throughout this series, especially in the last two, uh, the last three games. I guess the, you can say the last three games. I, I actually wouldn't count game five. Game five stunk. But game three and four were were probably the most exciting kind of playoff hockey I think anyone could have experienced. Like, just look at the whole series itself. Again, I have, and I said it in my episode, the the best. In, my, in the last four years prior to this, this playoff run, I was going into the playoffs with high expectation for the Leafs. I thought that they were a well-structured team and they should do well. Obviously, what happened happened in the last couple of years in the playoffs. Going into this playoff, I had a high expectation, but not as high because of what happened during the regular season. On paper, we should have probably won this series, but again, there's always that doubt in the back of my head where I'm like, I, I really don't like this matchup. The, the Leafs have had like trouble staying consistent throughout the season, and with everything that's happened, it just didn't look good. And clearly, it showed. The Leafs just absolutely tanked in this series, regardless if it went to five games or not. Like losing two nothing the first game, then winning three nothing the second game, and then the OT fiascos of game three and four. First time in NHL history that it's ever uh, a team has gone up three nothing and lost four three, and then 24 hours later. Winning four three by coming back or by uh yeah by coming back in a three nothing deficit, so the whole the whole series was a roller coaster of emotions. I was probably madder at this team than I've ever been. Just watching them play was was horrible, and they said it best. Like the Leafs had a two percent shooting percentage out of all five games. To people that don't know what that means, that means they done didn't shoot. And didn't score with those shots. Like everyone was a their top players that are supposed to be scoring were ghosts throughout the whole series. I think the only players that showed up in that entire playoff round were Morgan Riley, Austin Matthews, and I'd say Frederick Anderson. But there was like there were a lot of goals where, you know, I did the whole oof Freddie kind of thing. A lot of Leaf fans, uh, it's a lot of Leaf the, fans do like the, oof Freddie. The the, the, fo- the foodie goal was rough in the fifth game. Yeah, so it was just. A very, very, very disappointing series as a Leaf fan. But looking at it from the outside as a regular hockey fan, you're probably enjoying your popcorn, sitting back in your chair and watching these teams just absolutely go at it for a five-game series. So good on Columbus. They are the better team. I'm not ashamed to admit that they are the way better team than us. And, I mean, we they're coached by a really strong coach in Tortorella. And Sheldon Keefe shot himself in the foot a lot of times. He kind of outcoached himself. So it is what it is, and we move on. Yeah, I mean, there were a lot of... I mean, he's a rookie head coach. I mean, it, it, he, he's going to learn from these things. He, he's not going to oh, yeah. come into the league as a rookie head coach and just be able to know every scenario possible in a playoff run, especially a guy like Tortor, against a guy like Tortorella who has been in Tortorella court. praised him. I know. Tortorella praised him and coaches that saying, like, I don't know why people are giving him crap. They're saying his... His, what they did to adjust throughout this playoff round, he said he's never seen out of a rookie head coach. So, But again, Keefe was a rookie head coach going up against yeah. like a, a, a 20-year veteran head coach that has won a Stanley Cup. So I, I like obviously you can blame Keefe for certain things like playing Janssen coming off of an injury, some of the yeah. other lineup changes that he made. But for the most part, I don't really know if you can yeah, blame Keefe for every single thing in this playoffs. I will say uh, positives for the Blue Jackets. I mean, we knew what they were going to try to do coming into the series. You knew what kind of game plan they were going to they were going to try to play with their defensive style and their their trap and everything like that. Their defensively sound team take their chances when they need to, but uh, wow, what can you say about I mean, I know that the Leafs didn't get the greatest shooting opportunities, but you have to be pleased with the goalie tandem of Merzlikens and Corpus Salo if you're a Columbus fan, especially last year losing Bob to free agency and not knowing what was going to happen with Corpus Salo and Merzlikens, but you got to be pleasantly surprised on how they played in this series. Oh yeah, they they played great, but now they're going to have to rely on solely Corpus Salo because I read yesterday that Merzlikens is out out indefinitely with an injury, so they're kind of SOL for a two-goalie tandem going forward. Um, but yeah, they played They played great. They they literally, all they did was, <laughs> I watched, it happened almost most games and not. Columbus saw the way Toronto was entering the zone and forechecking and their offensive strategy. 
They collapsed in tight, and that's all it took, and Toronto didn't do any adjustments. So it was basically like, okay, you're going to come in and doing the same thing. We're going to do the same thing and just keep dumping the puck out and ragging the clock. They did that. You saw the most out of that in Game 5 especially. So good on Columbus for taking advantage of that. It's a, it's a boring strategy, but it worked against a team like Toronto. Yeah, I mean, teams like the Islanders and, and Blue Jackets, they play boring hockey, but sometimes that ends up working out come playoff time. So we'll have to see how the Blue Jackets will do in the second round against Tampa, which we'll get to. But, uh, yeah, the Blue Jackets taking down the Leafs 3-2. And if you want more in-depth analysis on that, just go watch Kyle's uh, Leafs edition episode uh, for his recap of the Blue Jackets and Leafs series. But uh, with that being said, let's move on to a series that I expected to go five games. And unfortunately, due to some injuries early on in the series, it really wasn't much of a matchup. Unfortunately for the Winnipeg Jets, Mark Shifley and Patrick Laine went out in game one of this series, and for the most part, they were just trying to play keep up and get retribution on Calgary for, you know, basically taking out mm-hmm. their two two of their top three or four players, and it was just tough sledding from that point for the Jets. I mean, in the in game four where they they eventually got eliminated, they had Blake Wheeler playing center, who is a obviously not a centerman, so the Winnipeg was just, they were just shorthanded from the beginning, and the Flames took full advantage of that and pretty much had an easy series win 3-1. Yeah, like the, I think the most exciting part of the whole series was that whole Kachuk thing, and that was probably the most talked about thing, and I think that maybe really got in the heads of uh, Winnipeg. I think they kind of let their emotions take control of them and and lost sight of their games. And Calgary just jumped and took advantage of that. And they they showed why they're they're such a strong team. Uh, they're such a if I get, they're a strong two way team from what I've been watching through the the Calgary Flames. They they have they've built their team on on offense and defense, but most importantly, the offense being able to play a strong defensive game at the same time. So. You, you apply that to getting into the heads of Winnipeg, and there you get a 3-1 series win. I really thought it was going to be a, a really good series, a really even series. I like the makeup of both these teams, but it would have been interesting to see if the Jets would have been able to pull it off uh, with Shifley and, and Line A playing, but... That's what Kitschuk yeah. does. He tries to get under your skin, and he clearly did his job well in the series, and Calgary made quick work of the uh, injury-plagued Winnipeg Jets with top talent being gone. So good on them winning that uh, series handily after that 3-1, but we'll have to see how the Jets come back from this. I still think it was a, su- a successful year for the Jets coming in with all the turmoil with Dustin Bufflin, and they lost a lot of guys to injuries early in the season, and they still mm-hmm. ended up making the playoffs. So hopefully next season they'll come back stronger, and uh, you know if they, some of their young players are able to come up, uh, like Christian Vaselainen, we'll have to see if he's ready to go. But uh, I still think that there's big potential here for this Jets team. Yeah, they, they are still built to be a playoff team next year. Um I haven't really looked at their team uh, financially, like what they have to resign. I have Cat Friendly up here. They do have to. Uh, there is a plethora of uh, players to resign. No one big, uh, from what I've seen. I think maybe just uh, a couple of their rookies. Uh, Dmitry Krulikov will have to decide if he if he's going to be a stay or go. I assume they'll resign Nathan Beaulieu, um and Sammy Naiku, and then uh, they'll have to decide on Lucas Spezia and uh, some others there. But uh, other than that, they're still built for a playoff team in the future. Mm-hmm. So uh, moving on here, a couple snooze fest series that we're not going to touch too much too much on because <laughs> I just expected these to be complete snooze fests. Uh, Islanders beating the Panthers three one. Not much you can say on that. I mean, I expected the Islanders to come out and win that series pretty handily just by the way that their team was built with Barry Trotz. And same thing like Columbus. They just play a good defensive style. It's boring to watch. Did not watch most of these games uh, for the it Islanders and Panthers. From what I've seen, Florida just didn't know what to do. Like, they didn't change their strategy. They left Bobrovsky out to dry half the time. It was just like they didn't know how to handle New York style of play. And it, it killed them. Like they they didn't they didn't have any injury problems. They were stacking their forward lines. They just they didn't know how to solve solve. Uh, sorry, they didn't know how to solve the Islanders. And it was kind of like the same thing in, with the Leaf series. Like Leafs didn't know how to solve Columbus's defensive game. It was basically the same for Florida. I really think Florida trading away Vincent Trocheck really hurt that team more than they think it did because losing a second line center like that. Yeah, I just, that was I just, a big loss. I just don't don't really understand the point of that trade, but. 
uh, regardless, the Islanders moving on, which uh, was to be expected as uh, they're just a, a team that's built for the playoffs. So we'll have to see how they go moving forward. The other series was Vancouver and Minnesota. Didn't really see the Wild putting up much of a fight, although they did win game one. But then the Canucks came back with three straight wins. And the fourth game, the, the series clinching game, was actually an exciting one. The Canucks had to battle back and then won it in mm-hmm. overtime. So uh, good for Vancouver. They're a young, exciting team. I, I've been, again, I didn't watch much of the series, but I did enjoy watching uh, Vancouver. They do have uh, some exciting flash on that team for sure moving forward. Oh, yeah. They have a lot of skill up front with uh, Brock Besser, uh, JT Miller kind of finding, I think JT Miller's definitely found his groove and what team he, he, he's looking to break out with especially and in, in Tyler Toffoli as well Tyler Toffoli I mean he was great with the Los Angeles Kings it kind of seems like he's keeping up that pace with the uh Vancouver Canucks and it's been said that higher management loves Tyler Toffoli's game and he's definitely probably going to get an extension so to have some cap issues to work with coming up uh which I imagine that they'll do what needs to be done but uh, other than that uh yeah Vancouver looks like a very uh fun and exciting team to watch as the playoffs go on yeah and Quinn Hughes and Elias Pettersson being the staples on defense oh and man center Quinn there. Hughes is a stud that kid is just that kid's gonna be one of the top defensemen in the league like in, in a couple of years he's just he's just crazy good yeah so good for Vancouver they're moving on uh, a couple other quick series here. The the one sweep, I guess, of, this, of the uh, playoffs. <laughs> <laughs> the New York Rangers got swept, but they got Lafreniere, so it's okay. But uh, the Hurricanes making quick work of uh, God. The Hurricanes the look so good, man. I know it was the New York Rangers, but I, I expected the Rangers to win at least one game, man, or at least maybe two and, and force a game five. Like, it's just – they – the Carolina just looks so good. They look so fast in the puck. They they beat the they beat the Rangers with speed. Who the Rangers still have a lot of a couple of fast guys. They just Carolina looks very very good, and they're getting goaltending out of goaltenders you wouldn't expect to see like playoff goaltending out of. Especially like James Reimer in that last game was a stud. So I mean Carolina good for them, man. Yeah, no, the, they look like they're going to have a deep run as well. Their uh, Rod Brendamore has done a very good job coaching that team, so the Hurricanes are going to be a tough team to beat as well. Uh, moving on, yeah. the the Nashville Predators and the Arizona Coyotes, and yeah, I know I'm going to eat crow for this one because you picked Arizona, <laughs> I picked Nashville, and throughout the whole series you were just you know giving me hell about the Arizona continuing to win games and Nashville again. Uh, Cogno, a couple of our uh, Nashville friends. Uh, down there who follow the Predators very much. So from the outside looking in, I don't understand how this team doesn't win. I mean, they have one of the best rosters up and down on paper in the entire NHL. But for whatever reason, it seems like their chemistry does not work well. And their high-end their high end and uh, highly paid players just don't seem to get it done when it matters. And I just it's I continue to scratch my head with this Nashville Predators team because if you look at their roster on paper, there's no way that yeah. this team should not be a top-four team in the league. Well, it's, it's, I, I kind of compare them to the Leafs a little bit here. Like, they on paper, you know, they, they have a team that should win, and it's gonna they're gonna be a, another one in the boat of having to restructure a little bit like it, like just like the Leafs the Nashville Predators are gonna have to sit back and look at their team and say okay what's gonna work and what's not gonna work and what's not gonna work is we move on from so and just I'm not gonna take anything out of Arizona's like fire here they were they have a solid team it's just on paper they shouldn't have been able to beat the the Nashville Predators the way they did but good on them and they they do have a good team and especially like their two goaltenders are just studs right now and have shown that they could get it done in the playoffs like they're they're backed by Antti Ranta and Darcy Kemper who are basically both two starting goaltenders on any team so two uh, two backup quarterback I mean a uh, backup quarterback backup goalies for most of their careers so yeah it uh it was it's cool to see Arizona go on and as another underdog team in the West they're good on them especially with all the turmoil with their GM John Chaka and Steve Sullivan taking over now so uh, good for Arizona being able to get through that distraction because I didn't think that they would be able to do that and Nashville it's going to be hard to retool because they have a lot of uh, they have a lot of money tied into a lot of guys yeah. that uh, it's going to be hard to move some of those contracts uh, I've talked to a few Nashville friends and they said maybe buying out guys like Kyle Turris would those have to bite the bullet on something like that but Nashville again they're kind of in the same boat like you said with the Leafs they, they have a lot of high-end skill but just cannot seem to get over the hump so we'll have to see how Nashville mm-hmm. goes, does but I'm I'm very disappointed that the Coyotes were able to beat the Predators so handily I thought that the uh, not only yeah. Nashville would win, but it would be a lot closer than that. Yeah. Um, 
But uh, moving on to the last two series here, the two biggest upsets of the entire playoffs, the two weakest teams going into the playoffs, the Chicago Blackhawks and the Montreal Canadiens, both taking down powerhouses in their respective conferences God. in the Pittsburgh Penguins and the Edmonton Oilers. Wow. I, have, I, I don't even know what to say about this. This is just... This just goes to show you that having five months off really does affect yeah. teams. And I remember saying back in our last episode that I wouldn't put Chicago out of it if they came and won this series because they they still have players on their team that have been to the playoffs before and know what it takes to win in a, in a, in a playoff series. And they those players showed up for the Chicago Blackhawks. Guys like Jonathan Taves, Brandon Saad, Patrick Kane, Duncan Keith, even though at his age, he's, he's getting there. Uh, Calvin DeHaan being able to be ready for them after that month break. That was kind of a benefit for Chicago. If the playoffs had started in April, DeHaan wouldn't have been there. So him Mm -hmm. healing from that injury and coming in and, and, and playing like a playoff defender really did help the Chicago Blackhawks. So it's, it's, it's crazy that uh, they defeated a team that Edmonton was projected to probably go pretty far in the playoffs, especially after the season they had. And what a coming out party for Dominic Kubalik. Wow. That guy, that guy, he's just, he's just nuts. Yeah. He, he, he's really like showing himself as a top goal scorer for the, for the Chicago Blackhawks. And even players that have uh, been journeymen that are young players that have not produced in other areas. You see Dylan Strome is now striving with the Chicago Blackhawks, Alex Nylander. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) But, uh, those players are stepping up for Chicago and, and backed by, like you said, that the leadership and the Stanley Cup, you know, uh, experience that Taves, Keith, Kane have. It really did show in this series. And uh, what a shock that the two host cities are out in the first round, Edmonton and yeah. Toronto. So that's that's going to be even for especially for Edmonton, because the finals are going to be played yeah. in Edmonton. So <laughs> the cup's going to be raised uh, in Edmonton, but not by the Oilers this year. Thank God that wasn't the Olympic. Scotia Bank. Oh that. yeah, I'm kind of happy they didn't. Oh, yeah, or else the I, I would have been bitter. Yeah. Well, no, all the all the fans. Oh, the Fleece finally raised a cup in Toronto, but yeah. it ain't oh, the I Leafs. Oh, all the dad jokes. Yeah, that would oh, have been yeah. great. That would be great to but, read. Uh, read those on a daily basis. But uh, yeah, Kubalik, he's playing for a contract. That kid, man, he's definitely showing that he's worth uh, uh, some big bucks. So good for him. Uh, speaking of big bucks, uh, the basically consensus Hart Trophy winner this year, Leon Drysital, did not show a lot in this series. Um, no, he did, was a ghost. Did not perform up to up to his he capabilities. Got points. He got a hundred points this year. How do you not? Per, how do you not show up? Like McDavid you... did all he could. Like he scored that highlight reel goal in the second game to propel the Oilers to come back after losing Game One. But for Drysaddle, like that that looks really bad on him. The fact that they he did not perform at all. Like he was like you mentioned, he was a ghost. He was. You saw McDavid out there try, but like you really didn't notice a lot of dry sidle. Yeah, yeah, they they're another team that might need to to retool a couple of things because they don't have a lot of people coming off the books, so they might be another retooling team this year. Yeah, the, their their depth and lack of depth scares me. Their goaltending scares me as well. Mike Smith yeah. obviously got lit up uh, in no, that he'll first be gone. game. He'll, he'll probably Blackhawks. retire. He's thirty eight. He's his contract's done. He's yeah. probably going to hang him up. So, uh, but. Koskin and even not. I mean, they did pay them, paying this kid four point five a year, and I, I don't know. I, I can't see. I, he's he's shown in games that he's been good, but he's not a a consistent goalie that I would put in the top fifteen or even top twenty in the NHL. That's a Peter Chiarelli uh, contract that's going to haunt the Oilers. Yeah. But hopefully, Ken Holland going into the second off season, he's a very good and established GM. So hopefully, he can retool the Oilers here because I feel like that's very disappointing for them for having you know. T- the two leading scorers in the NHL in McDavid and and Drysital and right. getting losing three one to a team that was essentially twenty fourth in the NHL so that's not a good look on the Oilers and on the flip side and even worse for the you know multiple time Stanley Cup champion Pittsburgh Penguins going down to the Montreal Canadiens the last team to sneak into this qualifying round and lose three to one in this series to the Habs. <laughs> and I I know we we've said that uh, Carey Price is an all world goalie. He might not be in his prime anymore to what he was a few years ago. But wow, he was he stood on his head and like we said, that was the only chance that the Habs had. And the old the Carey Price of old came out in the series and you gotta give the Habs and Claude Julian ever. Claude Julian credit. I mean they played a grindy series and they scored the, the timely goals when they needed to and they ended up a lot of these games were close. Like they won three two 
four yeah. three and then two nothing with an empty netter. So all these games are really close, and the Habs ended up coming away with mo- with uh, three of the four wins here. Yeah, it's the Habs secondary that's doing it for them. Guys like Joel Armia, Dale Weiss, Jordan Wheel, Nick Suzuki. These these are the guys that are, are performing for them. So, and I'm not trying to be a bitter Leaf in him, but this is where I'm going to come out and say it again. Like the the Habs don't deserve Carey Price. I'm sorry, they do not, man. This guy is on another level, and if they don't win a cup with this guy in the next like two years, two to three years, I I'm I'm sorry, they just wasted Carey Price, man. He's already 32. This guy deserves a cup very soon, man. Playing like that, like he's he's showing everybody why he was such a, a, a hot commodity in the draft when he was drafted. So yeah, so good for Montreal being able to. Uh pull through and for Pittsburgh that's a not a, like Edmonton not a good look on Pittsburgh no. wow a oh. team that's built for a Stanley Cup run they pick up guys like Patrick Marlowe and they have so much depth on their forward group uh, I just I just can't believe that uh, that they went out like that and there's going to be a lot of criticism on Matt Murray not being able to get it done uh, is oh, Tristan yeah. is Tristan Jari going to take over next year we'll have to wait and see or is, is Matt Murray going to get the uh, with, with what Pittsburgh did in the original expansion draft with them keeping Murray over Flurry are they going to do the same thing with him and let, and let Matt Murray go and keep Tristan Jari going forward now, the expansion draft coming up that's going to be a big question but uh, it's it's going to be interesting to see because it's it's going to the expansion draft is going to happen after the fact that Pittsburgh has to re-sign both of these guys. So they, they're they both, their contracts are up coming this offseason, which I guess the offseason is in October, like near Halloween-ish. So it'll be interesting to see. Like, I, I think it's weird to say that the offseason is going to be near Halloween. Mm-hmm. Like, what? <laughs> Might be some scary things going on. <laughs> Yeah, but maybe. Uh, I think they'll just re-sign both, and if Vegas t- maybe they'll re-sign Matt Murray to like a ten million dollar contract to screw over Seattle, be like, here we'll <laughs> sign him for ten mil, and then you can take him. How about that? Yeah, <laughs> and then they don't take him. But regardless, bad job for Pittsburgh. Just unfortunate because this is another team that was built for another Stanley Cup run and had another chance to continue their Cup dynasty that they've had. It uh, it's very unfortunate for guys like Malkin and Crosby to, to go out like that, and like like we said, it just goes to show you that the five months off really uh, did give any team a chance to win here, and Montreal proved it against Pittsburgh here in a David versus Goliath matchup. And if you pick Montreal over Pittsburgh, then you were lying. So I don't believe right. you at all. <laughs> But uh, with that being said, guys, that's wrap up for the uh, first round, the qualifier, I guess, even though it technically was the first yeah. round of the playoffs. We we're pretty even in picks. Uh, for the East, I was one for four. You were two for four. And then for the West, I was two for four. And you were one for four. Wait, so. I was one for four in the West? Uh, the West, yep. Yeah. What? Yeah, I have you as picking Oilers in three, Predators in four, Canucks in four, and Jets in five. Mm. Oh, yeah, they all failed me. <laughs> hey, Canucks didn't know. Yeah, good for them, I guess. And I did pick, well, and I picked the Leafs in five. So yeah, that didn't work out well. But uh, again, that was an unprecedented first round. It was uh, very exciting to watch. A lot of upsets, and we'll have to see if uh, if round two can continue with that. But uh, with that being said, guys, we're going to take our last commercial break on the show today, and we're going to come back and discuss the round two matchups for the Stanley Cup playoffs. We'll be right back here on the Under Review Podcast, right here on the Armchair GM Sports Network. J&L Flooring is a Niagara Bay specialty flooring and design company. They take great pride in providing elite customer service and support. They are a specialty flooring and decor boutique shop with a beautiful showroom, great pricing, and a wide variety and truly unique selection of products. All their products are environmentally friendly and responsibly produced, so you can feel great about your flooring choices. Their goal as a local business is to build authentic relationships based on honesty and integrity that they foster with respect and authenticity. Offering unique and wide range of quality products presented by a knowledgeable and patient team. They connect with their customers to simplify the process to make their life easier and to make their homes beautiful. Visit them at 4424 Montrose Road, Niagara Falls, or find out more at jnlflooring.com. Open Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. through 5 p.m. and Saturday, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. 905-358-3299 JNL Flooring. The Spicy Olive Bar and Grill is located on the top of Clifton Hill and just a five-minute walk from the majestic Niagara Falls. It is conveniently nestled in the heart of the tourist district. A family-owned and operated business, the Spicy Olive opened its doors in May of 2003 and has since been established as an authentic and unique Italian restaurant and bar. Its rustic ambiance and time-worn finishing provide a warm and inviting dining experience. Offering an array of delicious dishes, they specialize in authentic Italian cuisine, homemade sauces, 
fresh ingredients, and consistently providing a strong foundation on which they build their menu. As night falls, the Spicy Olive shifts to a lively lounge where drinks and live music come together to make a perfect evening. For more than 15 years, they have provided not only for their dedicated locals, but their customers from all over the world with authentic Italian food and great live entertainment. Open daily 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. for dinner and till 2 a.m. for drinks. Check out their new menu and book reservations on their website at Spicy Olive Bar and Grill, it's with an E at the end, dot com, or call 905 371 2323 for reservations as well. The Spicy Olive Bar and Grill. This is the Armchair GM Sports Network. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Under Review Podcast. Cappy and Kyle back with you here. Kyle, we've uh, touched on a lot of things as far as the first round goes. Let's get into the second round and what oh what we're looking at here for the second round of the Stanley Cup playoffs. And oh boy, do we got some uh, interesting matchups here. Uh, as Eastern Conference uh, people, we don't really want to see any team in the East win with uh, the teams that are left. But uh, let's let's talk about those. First off, we got Montreal and Philadelphia. Uh, the number eight seeded Montreal Canadiens against the number one seeded Philadelphia Flyers, who won the round robin uh, for the Eastern Conference. So, uh, what are you looking at from uh, Montreal and, and Philly? And again, now this is up to seven game series now, so no more no more best of five. It's back to standard best of seven series. This one's going to be an interesting matchup. I think it's going to be a very good series, to be honest. Especially if Carey Price is going to still play like he did in that first qualifying round, which I expect him to do. It's going to be a very tough go for the uh, Philadelphia Flyers. Not saying that they're they're not um, a strong team. They 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 definitely had some people show up, uh, some secondary people, uh, guys like uh, uh, Faraby, uh, showing that uh, he's proving his worth. And you know, obviously their their core guys showing that they can still get it done. But uh, it's going to be an interesting series, I think for sure. Um, uh, it's going to come down to uh, Carter Hart, I think, showing uh, showing that he can still uh, help the team in a playoff series. I mean, he's kind of broken out of his shell late in the, in this in the season with the Philadelphia Flyers, so it'll be it'll be cool to see. I'll I'll be interested to see this series. I'll probably be watching uh, the highlights. I don't know if I'll be watching this series live uh, mainly, but uh, for sure I'll be uh, tuning in to see what goes on. But uh, I actually have the Montreal Canadiens uh, getting it done four games to two, six games. Wow! Yeah. So you have Montreal taking out the uh, the battle of Pennsylvania there in Pittsburgh I, and Philadelphia. I think if they're strong enough to beat Pittsburgh, man, I think they can get it done against Philly. I think uh, Pittsburgh is the better team against Philly, even though Philly had that late surge in the season that propelled them to the first, uh, like into that like uh, top four teams to not have to qualify. I just Montreal's gonna have the the grit and the better hand here. I think because especially because Philly was playing games where teams weren't even trying half the time. I think that's gonna catch. I think Montreal's gonna catch them off guard. So I have Montreal winning six games. I think Montreal is definitely gonna be riding off of the momentum of them beating Pittsburgh. I think Carey Price is gonna show up again, but I just think that Philly is gonna use that the momentum that they've gained the second half of the season and what they did in the round robin which again uh, wasn't the most competitive hockey but I've got Montreal I've got uh, Philadelphia winning 4-2 so I got the opposite of you all right going with Philly to get it done in six games I just I think Montreal is going to come out flying but I just Mm. think in the end Philadelphia's skill is going to is going to outdo them and Carey Price is going to have to stand on his head every single game they were given a mixed bag with the times, too. It looks like they got 8-3, eight, 8-3 three, eight, three for the first four games. And it just seems like in a seven-game series, it's going to be tough for Montreal to, to get it done. A five-game series, maybe it would have been more doable. But I think in a seven-game series, to take four games from the Flyers is going to be tough. So uh, Kyle's got the Habs and another upset, 4-2. I've got the Flyers in a, in a 4-2 win, just flip-flopped. Into the next matchup, Kyle, and I know this one this one stings because this uh, should be uh, the Toronto Maple Leafs logo here beside the Tampa Bay Lightning. But uh... at this point, I, I I don't think it should anymore because after watching that, we should we don't deserve to move around because if we had moved on playing like that, I I would have been scared to play this series. 
So Tampa Bay against the Columbus Blue Jackets, and again, a rematch of last year's first round matchup with the huge upset of the Tampa Bay Lightning being the President's Trophy winners, having one of the best seasons in NHL history, being swept by the Columbus Blue Jackets, who had never made it past the first round in their franchise's history. Uh, do, you, do you see that being a uh, repeat, or do you see Tampa no. Bay... Although, minus Stamkos and minus Hedman going into this series, uh, getting it done. Now, I think the big question will be is how long-term are those injuries? Because now, I mean, it's it's if they're not long, this is a, se- this is a, a potential seven-game series here. So, I think if the injuries aren't that bad, which I don't, off the top of my head, I can't really think of what the injuries are and how long they're out for. But... Uh, uh, I still think with those two out that Tampa Bay still has a, a well structurally built team. They have a lot of guys, uh, a lot of rookies that are, are showing that they can hang in the top six. Guys like Anthony Sorelli, um, Braden Point. Obviously, Braden Point is just an absolute stud. Uh, Andre Pallad has shown a couple of times that you know he can still get it done even at his age. And then uh, Yanni Gord's another one that's been uh, stepping up a little bit for them. And I hope so for making five point one for like the next six years. So. Um, <laughs> Anyways, just the, the team looks pretty solid on paper. I mean, even without those two huge guys for them, um, I still think they could probably get it done. But this is going to be a tough one. I, I think this series for sure is not going to be another sweep walk in the park for any team. I think this is going to go the distance. I'm picking this one to go seven games, and I actually have Tampa Bay winning in second game or seven games. Wow. So hopefully Vasilevsky and uh... – and Kucherov can pull it out as the uh, the yeah. MVPs for this team. We'll have to see. Um, I still am weary about Stamkos and Hedman injuries being tough for this Tampa team to overcome. Although they are stacked from top to bottom, so it it would hurt it. It doesn't hurt them as much as it would hurt most teams uh, because of how stacked the Tampa Bay Lightning are. Columbus, though, again, we don't know if Zach Berensky, if he's at 100% because he did get hurt in that Leaf series. He did play in Game 5, but we don't know uh, mm-hmm. what percentage he is uh, injured or not, uh, how how well he's going to be in this series. So, I'm honestly, after what Columbus showed me against the Leafs, Tampa Bay is a similar built team, a very high-octane offense like the Leafs were. I'm going with the Columbus Blue Jackets in this series. I think they're going to win it in seven games. I really do. Mm-hmm. I think that, uh, like you said, it's going to go the distance. It's going to be tough for Tampa to close out a team like Columbus, but Tampa being the being a powerhouse team like they are, I still think that they're going to win some games. But I think Columbus is just really built this year for this format, and I really like the Columbus Blue Jackets right now. I'm saying the Blue Jackets in seven win this series. So I have updates on the injury. So Victor Hedman's only a day-to-day. With his leg, it actually uh, he could play on the first game. It'll be determined closer to puck drop, but might be available for second game. It's Steven Stamkos who's uh, listed as out, and he won't. Be, he says he will be remain sidelined, but and won't be available for game one. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see if if Hemming can come back. That'll be huge for the back end for Tampa Bay. But Stamkos being out definitely does still hurt. But uh, you got him going in seven. Or the Columbus Blue Jackets have it going in seven. I have uh, Tampa Bay going in seven. So it'll be an interesting series. Yep. Moving on here to a series that uh, oof, Barry Trotz facing his old team that he won a Stanley Cup for. Washington yeah, this, Capitals. This versus, will be interesting. <laughs> versus the New York Islanders. Again, another, like the Columbus Blue Jackets of Tampa Bay, you have a high-octane team like Washington against a very defensively structured, defensively sound team like the Islanders. This is a tough one to pick. Yeah, this is... I, I can't see... A clear-cut winner out of this one, especially like we've talked about the Islanders like on and on again. How structurally built they are—they're a team that's that's a four-line team coming straight at you. It, I mean, it, it, does it catch Washington off guard? I don't know. I don't know if Washington, from what I've seen in the uh, the round robin, doesn't really look like they're they're trying that hard. They did in their first game. I remember watching that. Uh, they look pretty good, and Ovi was 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 grooming himself. Him being such a professional that he is, and being you know one of the top players in the league, you know that guy's going to want to get into a playoff groove really fast and be able to help his team in the next in the in the I guess technically the first round. But um, there, I think the problem with Washington is I don't think uh, I mean we've seen this in the past. I don't know who's starting in net in this series. I mean, they had their rookie goaltender, Ilya Sansonov, who's been showing that he's a stud, man. This kid's their goalie of the future. But are you, are you starting Brain Holpe, who's got that playoff caliber, who's won them a Stanley Cup? Like, it's 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 kind of a mixed bag, and that that, that kind of 
messes with the team like emotionally sometimes like if there's two goalies and you're not sure what you're going to get out of each goalie especially going into a series against uh, the New York Islanders but for some reason I still think Washington can get it done uh, and I have them winning in six six games I think you got to give Holpe uh, the the reins here he may get moved on in this offseason who knows it might be his last hurrah with Washington we'll have to see because like you said Samsonov seems like he's going to be their goalie the future but uh it's hard for me to pick against the Washington Capitals just because they have won a Stanley Cup in the last few years. They're a very solid team, but you look at Barry Trotz, he was over with Washington, won them that Stanley mm-hmm. Cup, so he might he might know what they want to do and have a perfect game plan for the New York Islanders and, and set the trap for the Washington Capitals, but you know, I could see the Islanders definitely winning this series, but I'm going to say Washington wins it in six games. Okay. All right, so we're both even with that pick. But again, I can easily see yeah. the Islanders oh, winning yeah. the series. There's like, if they if they come out and just get Washington in to play the to play mm-hmm. the style that they want to play, it's going to be tough for Washington to be able to break that mold. And and like you said, the Islanders are running four lines. They're just they're such a sound team that it, they're built for this type of format. Yeah, I think you, we're going to see uh, out of the gate. Uh, we're going to see how the series is going to be after the first two games. Uh, you can definitely determine a winner after those two. Even if it's even if the series is one one after two games, I think you can. We're going to definitely know who's coming out of that. Yeah, we're going to see if the who is going to be on their game. I would love to see. Imagine the Eastern Conference Final: the Islanders versus the Blue Jackets. Who's going to win that defensive battle? Oh boy, God, that would be the most boring <laughs> Eastern Conference Final yeah. of all time. But uh, maybe we get that. Who knows? And uh, last series, Kyle, your favorite team in the whole world, the Boston Bruins versus the Carolina yeah. Hurricanes. And uh, we got the news uh, this morning that Dougie Hamilton will play uh, against the Carolina Hurricanes. I mean, against the, his old team, the Boston Bruins, sorry, in game one. Sorry, it's a game time decision, but will most likely play. So that'll be huge for Carolina's back end if Dougie Hamilton is able to play that game. What are you looking at from this series? Obviously, we gave Carolina a lot of oh. praise in their first round series. And we know what Boston is when we come playoff time. They're a tough team to knock out. Yeah, it's it. This is going to be an interesting series. I think it's it's weirdly a weird coincidence that Carolina has the same kind of built team, but with obviously with better success this year as the Toronto Maple Leafs, and they kind of play the similar style, right? They have the the high end speed up top with the skill for for forwards, but definitely Carolina has the, the, the defensive edge over the Maple Leafs for sure. So that could be a a huge benefit for them against a, a team like Boston, but. It was a team built like the Carolina Hurricanes and Toronto Maple Leafs that are Boston's weaknesses. So I do think Carolina has a little bit more of an edge against Boston in a playoff series than Toronto. It's just it's going to be interesting to see who they play in net. I don't I really would hold off on James Reimer because you probably want him to get revenge after 2013. But he's going to have nightmares of 2013 if he's going to play the Bruins and that might mess with him mentally. So I, I really wouldn't play him in this series. But even with uh, Mrazek and net, I think Carolina's got a very good chance uh, against the Bruins, but not knocking the Bruins out here. Bruins are just a playoff built team. Like they they show up the most in the playoffs rather than the regular season. The regular season is almost like a cakewalk for them, and then they sh- really show you like their their style of play in the playoffs, like that ground and pound, get in your head, mess with you mentally, and then just bring out their goal scoring to score goals on them. But uh, it's going to be interesting to see. I have uh, I have this series actually going to Game Seven again. Uh, this is going to be a very tough matchup, but. Uh, you know what? I'm gonna go with my gut here. I think Carolina is gonna be the team to get it done. I think they're gonna they're gonna beat the Bruins, and it's gonna suck. It's gonna be bitter for me to watch another team beat Boston in technically round one of the playoffs rather than my team. But I think Carolina can get it done. I'm picking them in seven games. Seven games. Wow, Carolina yeah. giving them a lot of credit. Boston went to the Cup final last year. I think it's gonna be tough to think that they won't get back there this year. I'm picking the Bruins in six games. I think they win this four two. Um, okay. I do think Carolina is a good team, but. Boston just with their the way that their team's built, they are a cup contending team with all the skill up front, but also being able to play have a defensively sound game. And Tuka Rask and Ned has been very solid this year, so I have to go. As much as I hate the Boston Bruins, I mean we both have our bond and our hate for the Boston Bruins as Sabers and Leaf fans. But again, I have to give credit where credit's due, and I just think Boston's going to be way too tough to beat. So I'm picking the Bruins in six games. No, for sure, you're right there. Just I'm this. Playoffs has shown how unpredictable it can be, so mm-hmm. I'm I'm sticking with my unpredictable pick here. Uh, unpredictable pick, God, it's hard to say. Yeah. So uh, yeah, you got the the 
the Hurricanes in seven. I got the Bruins in six. So that's it for the Eastern Conference. Uh, let's move on to the Western Conference, and we'll start off with you know the unpredictable picks. You picked Arizona in round one. Are you really going to pick them this year against the team that I think is going to the Cup final and probably going to win the Stanley Cup in the Colorado Avalanche? So you, do you have the cojones to pick the Arizona Coyotes once again? I'm going to say that I have the cojones and I will be picking the Arizona Coyotes. I'm sticking with the dark horse pick here. They just beat the the Nashville Predators three games to one, a team that – on paper, just like the Colorado Avalanche, should be able to walk through the Arizona Coyotes, no problem. But Coyotes have shown a grit that I've never seen before, and an unlikely grit out of a team like that. I think they're going to surprise Colorado. They're going to kick. They're, I think they're going to be able to beat them. And I have Arizona actually beaten them in five games, four games to one. What? Yeah. <laughs> We've seen an unpredictable playoff here. We're going to get another unpredictable series. Arizona is going to be the talk of the town. They're going to do it five games, four games to one. Maybe if they wear those Cochina jerseys all, all series, I can get behind that because the Arizona Coyotes should go back to those full-time. Those jerseys are fantastic. Oh, they're beautiful. Yeah, I like them updated too. They look really good. As much as I like those jerseys, I think Colorado is going to sweep Arizona. So there you go. You think Colorado, it's a sweep, eh? Colorado in four <laughs> games. Like, wow. I'm sorry. Colorado... <laughs> My man crush this year is on Colorado. I love Miko Ranton, and he's my favorite player in the league. But just with all their weapons, just unbelievable. Like, I just don't see this team getting beat by anybody this year. Unless, again, Arizona comes up with a big upset against Nashville. Maybe they end up pulling it off against Colorado. But you know what? I'm going with the Avalanche in a sweep. I just think they're way too strong, way too fast of a team for anybody to keep up with Other that's not named Edmonton, and they're now out of the playoffs. So I think Colorado is going to go all the way to the cup final and win it, so that's why I'm picking Colorado to sweep the Arizona Coyotes and get rid of this uh, underdog story that you have uh, piggybacked off of this playoff. <laughs> so hopefully Colorado can do me a solid here and get rid of Arizona quickly so I don't have to hear you all series. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Moving on to the Vegas, the number one seeded Vegas Golden Knights against the Chicago Blackhawks, coming off their huge upset win against the uh, the Edmonton Oilers. And f- oddly enough, Robin Leonard has announced that he will start Game One against wow. his former team, the Chicago Blackhawks. The team I think that you have to man mentally the, like that, that that needs to be done. The team that traded him at the trade deadline to Vegas. He's, yeah. Leonard is now playing against against the Blackhawks, and again, I don't know if Flurry's injured or what's going on, but I don't understand why Flurry's not starting. Again, yeah, I don't think uh, I don't think he had strange. the greatest year, but there's so, there's got to be something going on because Flurry has been the guy in Vegas since they moved there. Yeah, and again, like Robin Leonard just got there. Why is he starting over Flurry? So obviously, there's something going on with Flurry, but they must believe in Robin Leonard to go up against his old team, the Chicago Blackhawks. Kyle, what are you thinking? I, I don't, I don't understand this pick. I, I understand the fun and game side of it, but this is not fun and games here. This is round one of the Stanley Cup pl- playoffs. You, you, you start your your best goaltender up front, and to start Robin Leonard. That's, I mean, it's a mental game, but like, oh, yikes. I don't know. I, I I really don't know how they could be starting Robin Leonard over Flurry. Flurry is uh, a Stanley Cup proven, uh, playoff proven, regular season proven goaltender. I think he's had a really solid year this year, and I, I don't understand this pick unless they're just going with the first one, you know, and, and seeing how it works out. Yeah, I. <laughs> Again, Robin Leonard has had a good season since coming to Vegas, and he's revitalized his career the last few years. It'll be interesting to see if he, or if if it might backfire. Chicago has had Leonard, so they know what his weaknesses are. Uh, they play him in pra- They played him in practice all year leading up to the trade. So, I think Vegas is gonna win this series. I do think Chicago might put up a fight with their Stanley Cup uh, resume and experience. I think Vegas wins this in six games. You know, starting Leonard off the bat really messes with my pick here because I don't know if they're planning on just doing that for game one or the entire series. Because if they do it for the entire series, I think Chicago can get it done. I think Chicago, it'll take uh, it'll take six or seven games, but uh, I think for sure they can get it done if they start Leonard every game. But that's the thing. I don't know. I don't know if they're doing this game one to see how his mental game is in that one. They'll, they'll base it off that, but... 
my gut's telling me that they're starting Leonard for this entire series. So I'm I'm going to stick with my gut here. It's <laughs> It's been interesting sticking with it uh, a couple of times. But I'm picking Chicago. I think this is going to go seven games. I think Chicago is going to win the seven games. Wow. So you're picking yeah. Chicago in another to go through another strong team. Vegas is another just built from top yeah. to bottom team. Again, I don't, I'm not a fan of Vegas whatsoever. I didn't like them going to the Stanley Cup in their first year and everything like that. So I've never been a Vegas fan at all. But I just think that they're too strong against a team like Chicago. Their depth from top to bottom. Edmonton, they have the top end skill. They don't have the depth that Vegas has. So I don't know if Chicago's depth is going to be able to hold up to that. But again, Chicago proved us wrong in the first round. Maybe they can do it again. So you've got Chicago winning in seven. I got Vegas in six. Okay. Interesting. Moving on to a series that uh, oof, I don't really know how I feel about this series. Calgary Dallas. Oof. This is a weird one. <laughs> this is very strange. This series. I don't see myself watching much of this series, but all I'm going to say is I think Calgary is going to get it done in five games. Ooh! Wow. <laughs> Didn't even think about that one. Just Calgary five games. You are you sure? I don't like Dallas. I I just don't like the way that their team's built. I like like obviously they've got a lot of skill up front. But they they don't have the depth that I like. I don't like their decor at all. Like I like Mira yeah. Haskinen and, and Klingberg. Or, but like, I just don't like the depth that they have at any position. I don't like their goaltending depth. I don't like their defensive depth, and I don't like their forward yeah. depth. So I just think Calgary, from top to bottom, is a much better structured team. And we saw what they just did to Winnipeg, although a shorthanded Winnipeg. So I don't like. I think Winnipeg's way better than Dallas. So I'm going with Calgary in five games here. I'm my gut's telling me uh, Dallas, so I'm picking Dallas in six games. Wow, yep. you're just you're just going with the gut and all the underdog picks. Yep. <sighs> in I a just... way, Dallas ain't the underdog pick. They're ranked three, and Calgary's six in this one. They are, but I just I don't know Dallas. I just don't like the 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 makeup of their team, but maybe they end up getting it done. Who knows? But I think their their second <laughs> their secondary scoring is going to have to come up huge in the series if they want to get through it. That that's all I have to say about that. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, with not much else to say about that series. Uh, again, Calgary had a pretty easy route against a shorthanded uh, Winnipeg Jets. So we'll have to see how they take that going into this uh, series here. And lastly, the defending Stanley Cup champion St. Louis Blues going up against the up and coming young, exciting team, the Vancouver Canucks. Okay, this one is tough. This one's very tough. Uh, Vancouver is... Uh, this is going to be a tough one for Vancouver to win. Plain and simple. You got the defending cup champions who are, are still proving that they're a strong team. Uh, I've caught a couple of St. Louis play-in games uh, from the round robin. They I mean, they struggled a little bit, but uh, it's it's funny that while they were struggling, their backup goalie, Jake Allen, has shown that uh, he's actually... Uh, ready to go. He had a really solid last game. I, I didn't see what the final score was of their last play, uh, round robin game, but uh, St. Louis, uh, they still have that playoff caliber team. They still have that Stanley Cup uh, finals like pump in them, I think, and they they're still going to want to go back to back. So this will, if Vancouver does it, it'll be tough. But uh, what's my gut saying? I'm gonna have to. Squeeze down here. Think of what, what's my gut saying? My gut. Okay. My I just I just listened to my gut. My gut saying Vancouver in seven games. There's no way that the stand the defending Stanley Cup champions are going down this early that quickly. So I'm going with St. Louis in six games. Okay. I do I do like Vancouver. I do think that they their team is up and coming. I think that they exceeded expectations this year. To be completely honest, with how young their te- their team was, and I think they've done a very good job this year. They obviously got past Minnesota in the first round, so I do like Vancouver a lot. But I just I just think you're gonna not you're not gonna be able to knock off the Blues out, at least until the conference final as the defending Stanley Cup champions. They're they're a playoff built team uh, to go right hey, back to that unpredictable. Finals unpredictable yeah. you're going with all the unpredictable picks it seems yep. like so uh, I'm, I'm i'm sticking with that that pro that, that promo the stanley cup playoffs unpredictable <laughs> just don't do the stanley cup commercial that we get in canada that lays commercial. oh yeah <laughs> i can't i can't handle that commercial anymore that commercial's done oh yeah that's horrible. the worst part get, of the stanley cup bad. final uh playoffs yep. is that commercial so uh kyle's got vancouver in seven over the stanley cup champion st louis blues who i have beating vancouver in six games so that's it for the eight series that are going to happen from the East and the Western Conference for the second round, Kyle. Lastly, before we wrap up the show, do you think that uh, these teams that actually played competitive series in the first round will have a 
a little bit of an advantage of these teams that were playing in the round robin and playing essentially exhibition games. Do you think that uh, those teams that uh, have already played the first series might catch them off guard a little bit and uh, maybe have a little bit uh, more of a readiness to go for playoff hockey? 100%. That's why with a lot of my picks, I, I went with the team that's had to qualify their way into the first round the way they're putting it. And I think that's going to be a, a benefactor in a lot of those games. So, and I, again, like I, I've been watching some of these qual- these round robin games and teams are, are not trying. And I sit here and wonder why you wouldn't try to try to at least get like a playoff grit going because you're going to go into this series now with you're going to say you're not going to go with the same mentality, but we'll see what happens. I mean, <laughs> We'll see how your play goes. It's it's going to be an interesting one. Yeah, and it's wow. We've we already saw what happened in round one. Round two looks like it's going to be uh, just as exciting. So it's going to be great to watch uh, watch this round of the playoffs and, like you mentioned, see if these teams are going to come flying out of the gate and catch some of these uh, higher seated teams playing in basically exhibition round robin games off guard here and maybe steal a couple of games to start the series, which could be huge down the road. It's going to be an unpredictable playoff. I'm still sticking with that motto. It's 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 definitely going to be and it's going to be fun to watch, especially now that we're excited that hockey's back and it's back in a format we're not used to, but it's definitely been exciting. Now that neither of us have a horse in the race anymore, it's going to be exciting to watch from the the outside looking in as just a fan of watching all these teams and I'm going uh, for my boys uh, Vancouver Canucks. I think that's the the team I'm going to stick with. Uh, damn, I thought you were going for the Boston Bruins. That's upsetting. Yeah, well, yeah, shocking, I know, right? (laughs) Well, folks, that's going to wrap it up for today's episode of the Under Review Hockey Podcast right here on the Armchair GM Sports Network, your source of North American sports coverage by sports fans, for sports fans, delivered to you right here from the good old Niagara region. As always, I'm one of your hosts of the Under Review Podcast, Cap. You can follow me on Twitter at Caputz13 with a Canadian Z, as well you can follow my co-host Kyle at JustKyle51 for his, uh, his, (laughs) his... Like sad tweets His now. Sad Toronto Maple Leaf tweets that have been going on for the last few days here. Uh, give him some love and uh, follow him on Twitter as well. Big thank you to all of our great sponsors who help put us on and support the network. Keep the show on the air and support your local businesses during this uh, this time. It's very important. Check out our sponsors. All of our sponsors have promo codes on our website. Go check that out as well. Finally, to you viewers out there for tuning in and listening along with us for this episode. Hopefully, we were able to give you some good analysis of the Stanley Cup playoffs and uh, going into the second round here. And once again, this has been the Underview Podcast on the Armchair GM Sports Network by sports fans for sports fans. We'll see you guys next episode. Go Avs. And for Kyle, I guess, go Yokes. Go Yotes, I guess. <laughs>